All right, uh, guys, welcome. I'm Joe Stagg with with uh, Intermountain Hydraulic Specialties. Uh, here to train you today on what are we call this one? Hydraulic piping. HVAC piping. HVAC piping. Okay. So obviously, with the uh, we, we're here talking boilers uh, today. We're going to talk about uh, pumps, valves, expansion tanks, and uh, the plane front heat exchangers. So really, nothing that we're going to be talking about should be new to you guys. Like last. I don't know how many days ago we taught on the boilers, but the boilers were a fairly new concept. This is all old school stuff, so you guys will probably be teaching me anything or two about, about this stuff. But regardless, we're here to, to train you on it. Um, I figure what we'll do first, I did bring some samples here because uh, you probably haven't seen any balancing valves like we've got, uh, like you're going to have here. They're a little bit different. You guys probably have uh, circuit setters out there. Um, when I was here last time, I asked you guys if you did. Uh, you had your own uh, balancing meters, your differential pressure gauges do, do your own balancing. You guys did have that? No, really. You don't have that. So you're not doing any of your own balancing now? No. It's balanced by the temperature of the coil. The temperature. I'm, I'm cold. cold. Open the valve up a little bit more. Yeah, okay. 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 All right. So I'll, I'll show you how to use these valves. Um, obviously, this uh, building, has it already been balanced? <laughs> it's being balanced now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the pumps. These pumps, you've got some vertical inline pumps. You've got some uh, base mounted split coupled pumps. Uh, they are the, the flexible coupling. Uh, and then we'll go through some plate frame heat exchangers. But I did see you guys have some very big plate frame heat exchangers. So again, nothing new. Uh, so uh, I, I was going to go over how to read a pump curve. Uh, I think that's pretty important when you guys work on pumps, when you work on these. But since we don't have markers, I can't really talk about pump curves. Uh, and then how to read the balancing charts for balancing valves. But uh, we won't talk about that either, I guess. So we'll just go over the O&M information, operation, operation and maintenance stuff. Uh, do you guys have anything, anything you want to address first, anything specific? Questions that have been bouncing through your head on these things as you've worked here? Uh, oh, we were here teaching that pump class. We brought that trailer. Yeah. We did that lunch. Um, that, those are the type of pumps you have here on this in this building here. So, um, what you saw there, and, and it doesn't sound like you'd be able to get out since I don't have a hard hat. I'd be able to get out and actually touch the product and show you the product. But uh, you guys did get that. we so we're trying to change that. Okay. Um, so we're going to jump way forward and get into uh, what's going to happen if you operate these things outside of their normal operation limits. You guys tell me, what's going to happen if you operate your pump where it's not supposed to be? What are you going to see? Lose your efficiency. Okay. Noise. How are you going to know? You're going to hear noise. What else are you going to see? I got called out to a job the other day. The pump was vibrating. If the pump is having some excessive vibration, that's a sure sign that you're operating something somewhere outside of its limitations. <coughs> Um, a pump is desi designed, uh, again, the biggest thing to, to remember with pumps, pumps are stupid. It has a motor, it has parts inside, but it has no idea what it's supposed to be doing. It's going to operate at what you tell it to operate. Uh, a pump does not create flow rate. That's the biggest misconception that even engineers have, is that if I put a pump in, it's going to give me flow. A pump does not give you flow. What a pump does is it spins in a centrifugal motion, and that centrifugal motion creates what? Pressure. pressure. It, ch it creates a differential pressure. And that change in pressure is what creates flow. So all the pump is doing is creating a differential pressure. So when you start working on pumps, when you start working on balancing the system, everything is pressure driven, not flow driven. Our temperature, yeah, you want flow, a specific flow through a coil. So how do you control flow? Controlling the pressure. So that's the biggest thing to remember when you're working with the pumps and the valves and, and everything we're talking about here is it's all pressure driven. So if your pump is making too much noise, chances are you're operating outside of its preferred curves. Uh, every pump curve, when you look at a pump curve, it's got uh, your efficiency curves that kind of wrap down around. As you move, move further away from your best efficiency point, if you go back towards the either end of your curve, you're going to uh, start creating a lot more axial and radial thrust forces on your pump. So what? What's going to happen? So what if I create too much force? So what if my pump vibrates? What's going to happen? We're in tear. What are we going to replace? 
this thing starts bearings. to vibrate, what's going to happen? What, what are we going to break? What are we going to ruin? Bearings, seals. Bearings, mechanical seals, the things you don't want to have to replace because you have to take the pump apart to do that. So it's important that you try to operate within that sweet spot of the curve. And have that the whole time. Should I just talk around through it? Yeah. Or not? Okay. Um, so it's important to try to, and that's what your balancing guys are here doing. They're trying to get it so that you're operating where you're supposed to be operating on that pump curve. We selected the pumps for the most, we tried to give you the pump for the best curve possible. But if you start to deadhead that pump, if that pump is producing as much pressure as it can, again, a pump is stupid. All it's doing is rotating at a fixed speed. If you've got VFDs, the VFD might be telling, okay, pump, I want you to operate at 16, 25 revolutions per minute. So the pump's sitting there doing that. It has no idea what floor. It could be pushing against a, a closed valve for all it knows. As it does that, it starts to drive up these forces because the fluid is not moving through there. So it starts to create turbulence. These forces will wear out your bearings. They will wear out your mechanical seals. So if you find that you're replacing a lot of bearings or mechanical seals on a pump, check your flow conditions. See if your, as your valves start to close, <coughs> chances are your VFD might not be ramping that pump down. If you don't have a VFD and all these valves are closing, then you are creating that condition that's going to happen. And you're going to kill your pump. Uh, we're working on another job where we have the pumps down there. And these people continually blame us that you've got a bad pump because your mechanical seal is leaking. Why would a mechanical seal leak? Is it the pump manufacturer's fault? Chances are it's not. Why would a mechanical seal leak? First of all, this is no, no pump manufacturer makes their own seals. They all buy them from somebody else. So all these seals come in. Uh, these guys make you know, tons and tons of seals. No seal manufacturer will warranty their seal. Did you know that? All these pumps that we have installed, there's no warranty on the mechanical seal. So if a seal leaks, why is it going to leak? You guys know how a mechanical seal works? You've got a fixed seat or a fixed face that's pressed inside the pump casing. What the mechanical seal is supposed to do is you've got your, your internal surfaces that's filled with water and it's pressurized. I mean, for this tall building, I think our pressures, anybody know what your pressures are? Probably pressurized at 60 PSI down here at the bottom or something. So you've got 60 PSI pressure. Again, going from last week or our last class, PSI G pressure, um, gauge pressure. So not, you know, again, con compared to what's around it, the atmospheric pressure, or 60 PSI above that. So we've got to keep this liquid inside the pump casing. We don't want it to leak out, but you've got this motor shaft or pump shaft that's penetrating that, that, uh, that casing. So how do we keep the liquid out? So inside that pump casing, you have a fixed seal that will be pressed inside that sits there. It doesn't move, it doesn't rotate. But then on the rotating shaft, it's got another seal, maybe a ceramic face. And these two faces are supposed to be pressed up against each other with a spring. A spring presses these two faces together, and as it rotates, we create heat. And what happens when we create heat? Things expand, and so it plugs up these orifices. It plugs up the waterways so we don't get leaking. So what happens if you have sand in your water? What happens if you have sediment in your water? As you have these two faces that rotate, what's going to happen? It's going to get in between there, and as soon as you start forming grooves in that mechanical seal, it fails. Is the manufacturer going to warranty that? No way. Because you didn't flush out your system. You didn't clean out your system first. Hopefully that's been done. Another big one is pH. Your water pH, your water chemistry is very important. pH will kill your mechanical seal very quickly. And with how every engineer here in Utah pipes these systems, they're just asking for these systems to fail. So, uh, again, I can't draw this. Um, you've got your pump. You've got your suction line coming in, you've got your discharge line going out. Where do you have your chemical pot feeders? Suction side. So you're, you're kind of bypassing the two, right? You're coming off your discharge, you're coming over to your, your bypass feeder, your chemical pot feeder, and you're dumping it right back in your suction, right? Most likely that's what everybody does, okay? So what happens? All these valves are closed, there's no water bypassing, it's just going through the building, but we open up that chemical pot feeder, we dump a bunch of chemicals in there, we close it, we open those valves. What did I just flush into the seal, into the mechanical seal? Chemicals, my pH is way out of balance. I just killed my mechanical seal, okay? The more you put chemicals in the system, the faster you're gonna kill that mechanical seal. We see this all the time when pumps are started up. Your, your, your manufacturer, you guys provided a, a piece of junk pump because your seal fails. It wasn't our fault because they treated it with chemicals and they didn't flush the system very well. 
So as you guys work on these pumps, that becomes very, very important. Watch your water chemistry, watch your pH, operate within the manufacturer's limited requirements, and make sure that it's being cleaned. Make sure you've got filters out there, you've got Y stringers. Um, your suction diffuser. A lot of people think that a pump suction diffuser is supposed to be a strainer. You've got a construction strainer in there. Hopefully these construction strainers have all been taken out. Okay, they're not acting as a strainer. Because of the big cast iron orifices that are in there to help straighten the water as it enters the, the pump, it will strain out big particulates, big chunks of wood or metal, but it's not going to strain out any particulates. It's not designed to do that. You should never strain out at the suction side of a pump because you'll kill a pump with low suction head. Okay, so if, you can't expect the straining to occur there. So as you start maintaining all of your circuits, all the straining should take place where? Discharge or, or, or where? Not on the discharge of the pump, because that will affect the flow of the system. Where are we doing all the straining at? Where are your wash strainers? Yeah, all the way out of the coils. Okay, we should be straining before we go to those, those smaller passageways, which are in your coils. So every coil on every air handling unit, every hot water unit heater, every, every piece of equipment out there should have a wash strainer on it. You need to be maintaining those wash strainers because that's going to take out the particulates. You can't take it out by the pump because it's not designed to do that because you'll kill the pump suction pressure. Okay. So particulates will kill, will kill a pump. You've got to make sure you're, you're doing your straining. If you start plugging strainers, please don't take the strainer filters out and keep them out. Okay. You're, you're obviously introducing dirty water or something to the system. Clean the system because you've got to have those filters there, those strainers, uh, the mesh strainers in there to make sure that you're protecting things like your pumps or you will start replacing the mechanical cells on a regular basis. Okay. Um, uh, your bearings. Your bearings Your bearings should have a very long life in the OM manuals, which we'll go over in just a minute. Uh, it does give you some operational hours. Uh, but again, if you have excessive vibration, it's not going to last that long. Okay? If you have excessive forces that are uh, occurring inside that pump, uh, I mean, picture this for me. Every one of these pumps that you have are in suction pumps. So we range from maybe 20 gallons per minute all the way up to, I don't know what, are, are we over 1,000 gallons per minute on some systems in this building? I know in the rest of your campus, you're way over that. But, you know, again, we're, we're going from very low flow rates to very, very high flow rates. But this is an, these are all in suction pumps, which means as your pump shaft is rotating, you've got an impeller mounted on that shaft. The flow enters one side of that impeller, what we call the eye of the impeller. As it spins, we're creating that differential pressure. So it's, it's creating the pressure we get the flow to occur. But you've got 600, 800, 1,000, 2,000, whatever it is, gallons per minute, slamming into one side of that pump. It has to turn 90 degrees and take off in the other direction. You think that causes excessive wear on a pump? You betcha. That's why they have double suction pumps. But you don't have any double suction pumps on this job. Our recommendation is anytime you get above 850 gallons per minute, you should go to a double suction pump. Well, we don't have that on this project. So you have in suction pumps. So your pumps that have very high flow rates will see excessive vibration. They will see excessive uh, wear and tear, even if the pump's not vibrating because of those axial and radial thrust forces that are occurring. So it's very important that you do pay attention to your, your, uh, your O&M schedule that it gives you in, your, uh, in the manual, just to make sure that you are checking those bearings. For example, it says that uh, every 8,000 hours or 12 months, you should uh, be checking your wear rings, you should be checking your bearings, um, and uh, making sure that nothing has excessive wear. Okay? I would particularly pay attention to this to your higher flow pumps. They're all in section design. Okay? Um, let's see, what else do we need to talk about pumps? Any questions on pumps? Who works on pumps? D does everybody in here work on pumps, or you're just all here for the training? In one way or another, you're going to be touching the pump. Okay. Uh, okay. Since we can't draw anything, I guess that's all we can really talk about. Uh, let's just go through the O&M manual real quick. Your vertical inline pumps. The vertical inline pumps you have on this job are close coupled. So they're going to look... Oops. Being close coupled means that they take a standard, or not a standard, they take a JM frame type motor. So this is what you've got. I know this is really clear for you guys back there. But you've got your motor, you've got your pump, and you've got a motor mounting bracket here, or motor mounting plate. Uh, 
this assembly allows that motor shaft. This motor is not an off-the-shelf motor. How come? Why can't you just run out any any motor shop and buy this this motor? What's special about it? Steel. Extended shaft. Extended shaft. Who said that? <coughs> Very good. They've got uh, that's what the jam is. It's an extended shaft, and at the end of the shaft, it has to have a uh, female screw tapping in there, so that we can bolt, we can screw the impeller onto that shaft. The motor shaft is actually penetrating into the pump, is into the pump housing. Okay. So that becomes important because of the design. So there is no split coupling here. There's no concern for alignment. The problem with the base mounted pumps that you get is it's a little different than that. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but we actually encourage it to be. So with this picture, you've got a pump shaft and then the impeller all inside the pump housing, but it doesn't show the motor. So you've got one shaft here with your bearings, and then you've got a coupling that will join the shaft with the pump shaft. Okay. Or I'm sorry, with the motor shaft. That coupling, you've got two pieces of equipment, two, two rods basically, that are trying to rotate at the same speed. If there's any misalignment whatsoever, it's going to cause failure. Okay. The nice thing about these pumps, I'll give you a great example of why you want to use a pump like this. Uh, in Montana years ago, we, we sold a bunch of big pumps on a new school. They, uh, everything sat on the field all summer long, all spring long. Towards the late summer, they thought, well, we've got to get this stuff in there. They grabbed the pipe, threw the pipe in, threw the pumps in, filled it with water, turned the water on, and within minutes, the pump failed. Where did it fail? We tore the coupling up. So the, 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 the contractor made the mistake of just taking that coupler out, put a new coupler in, turn it on, tore through that one. If the coupler fails, it's a sign that something's gone on. Couplers are designed to fail. Okay? It should be the weak link in your pump. So any pump that is a split coupled pump like this, uh, if the coupler ever fails, it's a sign that something's happened. Don't just replace it and assume that, okay, I can turn it back on and walk away. It's failed because something's occurring. When they finally open up the pump, uh, a nest and a rabbit was jammed inside the IE impeller because it had been living out there in the field all summer long. They didn't clean the system before they turned the pumps on. Okay. Anything that's jammed up in this impeller, or this impeller binds up for some reason, you'll bust the coupler, you won't kill the motor. So that's the first thing you should check. The other thing to check is excessive wear on a coupler will happen with even just a small misalignment. So typically our rule of thumb is with your low speed, and when I say low speed, 1800 RPM or less, typically our rule of thumb is about a 1 64th inch tolerance on your alignment. Now that can be measured with a straight edge. In fact, um, Rocky Mountain Mechanical, called us one day and said, hey, somehow one of these motors got pierced, uh, or the motor casing, something had happened during the installation, and something had pierced the motor, so we had to replace the motor. Uh, we, we gave them the motor, they put it in. When the system got turned on, they called us and said, something's wrong with your pump. Your pump is, is making some terrible noise. So we had to come down. It was a simple misalignment, which makes sense because anytime you disrupt that motor, you're now disrupting your alignment. So as they put a new motor on, uh, I'm sure they checked the alignment, but it wasn't within its tolerance, and so actually it was, it was pretty off, and so it was, it was really noisy. And over time, that would quickly, the worse the alignment, you'll quickly bust through those couplers. When you start getting into high-speed pumps, if you guys have 3,600 RPM motors, speed pumps out there, you better use a laser alignment. You guys have one? Do you have high-speed pumps? Check in. <laughs> I think, on this job, I know you don't. We didn't sell it. They were specified, but... That's why I avoid high-speed pumps if I can at all possibly do, because high-speed pumps, because they're rotating twice as fast, that alignment is twice as critical. No high-speed pumps, we do have two at 1,500, the condenser pumps. Okay. Um, 1,500, which would be lower speed than your 1,800. So anything 1,800 and less... 1,500 GPM, you were talking about. Oh, gas. you were talking about, about gas, gas per minute earlier. Yes, okay, so you do have high-flow pumps? Uh, two of them at 1,500, everything else is about... <coughs> Um, 650 or below. There's a couple of 30s. So if I had my way, you know, I would have specified on those 1500s a double suction pump so that you don't have excessive wear. Problem with the double suction pump is they quite cost more money because you have double bearings, double mechanical seals, and so they get a little bit more costly. They take a little bit more space. And it is also likely that this pump will not run at full volume. It's got VFDs on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So anyway, we, we sell these pumps, I mean just so you know, we sell these pumps all the way up to 2,500 gallons per minute. 
So just because we recommend that you go to something else doesn't mean you have to. But do not do it. And, and again, that's fine. I'm not saying it's, it's a bad application. I sell them that way all the time. It's just our recommendation. So that pump, when it's flowing, a lot of flow, it's gonna, you're going to create some pretty, pretty good pressures. Do you sell those laser alignment tools? No. Ranger. Yeah. Yeah, you, if you're... We've wanted one for a long time. Ago. We've been never by one. Well, once you have one, I, I recommend doing these. I mean, it's easy enough. Uh, on these pumps here too, just to do it, run the laser line. Yeah, or, or rent them. I mean, but it, it's something that uh, that should be done. In fact, in your O and M's on these pumps, on the schedule, it says to check your alignment once a year. Do you guys do that with all your split couple pumps? Check your alignments. If you want to reduce your your uh, maintenance costs, you should check your alignment every every year at least, every eight thousand hours. Eight thousand hours. I can check that. Did we ever price one day? Mm -hmm. Have we ever priced them before? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, they're not cheap. They're pretty pricey. I don't remember what they were, but. Yeah, realign a couple pumps uh, and maintain your records every 8,000 hours or 12 months. That's what they say. So, and, this isn't Patterson pumps that's saying this. This is Bellagossi pump, this is Tako pumps, this is Armstrong pumps. It doesn't matter. Anybody who makes a pump, you should be following similar procedures with. Okay. Alignment is critical. Alignment, and, and they specifically say that in these O&Ms, alignment is mandatory. You have to check that alignment. In fact, it's so important, the factory aligns the pumps before they ship. When they arrive, um, we are supposed to align them before they're installed. Then once they're installed and before they're turned on, they're supposed to be aligned the third time. Three times of doing alignments. And I can tell you that very few people do that here in Utah. So we do that when we typically do startup. On this pump, it obviously got missed because we replaced the motor. But with checking the rotation of your pump or your motor, and then checking your alignment, those should always be done every time you're working on your pump. Okay. Um, anytime you touch the motor, anytime you bump it, uh, you're walking by and, and you're you know, pull us on the get bump the motor, you should stop and just check that alignment. It's, it's very simple to do. I wish we could get out there. You guys ever check it? Who checks it? Who's done it? We've checked them using the magnetic. I, I, I carry a little metal ruler with me. And that little metal ruler, just check, what, what you do is you check it at, at four positions, 90 degrees apart, so top, bottom, side, side, and just make sure that there's no offset there from, from a flange to flange of your coupler. Um, in fact, this one that's out here, I think it's P3. Was it P? Does that sound familiar to you? P3. The, we had to replace the motor. Okay. These have big couplers because they're uh, VFD-driven pumps. They have to have a softer coupler insert uh, because there's the variable torque as the VFD slows and speeds up. So you don't want a hard, rigid plastic. You want a softer, pliable like an EPDM. But ours are kind of a, a big uh, bowed out type. So it's, you can't get a, a straight edge across it, so you actually have to take that piece out, then check your alignment, and then put the piece back in. I mean, it took us maybe five minutes to check the alignment. It's pretty simple. But you've got to check the alignment. Uh, and then uh, that, will, that will get your, um, uh, what is that? That's your parallel offset to see if your pump's side to side or up and down. But then if your pump is pitched at an angle, you need some type of calipers or something to measure the distance between the two sides. You'll measure a greater distance here than you would on this side if it's pitched. So you want to make sure you're angular and your parallel offset. So again, I, I can't stress it enough. When you're working with pumps, the, the alignment is the most important part. Okay. Uh, misalignment, you'll see vibration. You'll hear vibration. It might make some excessive noise. Uh, and understand that you are killing the coupler, which will require more maintenance on your part. Um, and, and that's what they're telling you here. They give you a schedule on, on how many hours in the O&M. Uh, that you should go routinely, and then how many hours to check different parts and components. Um, things like uh, unusual temperature, unusual vibration, these things should all be checked routinely. Um, the mechanical seal, obviously, if you have a mechanical seal that's leaking, you've got to replace it. Okay. Uh, oh. And that's, I think that pretty much covers that. Any questions on pumps before I move on to something else? So this pump. Mm -hmm. right there, the top mode, uh, 
There's no amendment issues? No. These, as it was explained to me years, years ago, this is where these operate, it kind of works like a top does. If you spin a top, they kind of self-balance themselves. Now, th that would tend to occur if it's a split couple, but this is a direct couple. This is a closed couple. So there is no alignment. When you only have one shaft, there's no alignment of shafts that has to take place. Um, so no, you don't have to check any alignment on your vertical inline pumps, but all of your base mounted pumps that have, and you'll notice on our pumps, they've got, if you've seen them out there, and if you remember from our trailer that we brought around a year ago, it's got a little orange housing, OSHA rated coupler guard, I'm sorry, yellow, yellow housing, and it's hinged at the top. You undo one wing nut and it flips open, and you can get access to the coupler. Again, we've given you quick, easy access, so it's not, it's not hard to, to check these things. If you see that yellow coupler guard, then that's a pump that needs its alignment checked. The other ones won't. Yeah, they're just all close coupled. Any other questions? Okay. Um, next, let's talk about your balancing valves. Uh, the balancing valves that you guys have are all manual. Uh, that's how the engineer lights it. So they're, they're going to require some manual adjustments. Uh, the engineer gave you balancing valves, but he also gave you isolation valves. If you see this, this smaller <coughs> valve out there, don't use this as your isolation valve. Okay, that's not what this is designed for. This, when the balancer is finished, this has a, uh, a little gauge on the top, and uh, I'll pass this around when I'm done so you guys can look at it. It's got a little gauge on the top so you can see the percentage of closed, percentage of open. Uh, you can loosen this up, balance it, set it, and lock it in so that it can't open beyond that point, but it can still close. So in theory, you could, I don't, you should never make it a habit, but you could use this as an isolation valve without killing your, your balancing. What you do, and you have just loosen it here, so you can set that, in fact, I'll set it there. So now that I've locked that, you can close the valve, open it back up to where it's locked, and then you've, you're still semi-balanced. So if I, if I may, speaking as a former balancer, <laughs> uh, especially when those are throttled at like 45 degrees or so, it takes a very little bit of range to make a pretty good size check of difference in flow. And we lock those down, and I know BTC locked those down on this job, but you guys are strong enough to pull past that stop. I mean, even if you just pull it to that stop, you've actually moved it. Yeah, I guarantee you. Yeah, this is not a characterized ball valve in here at all. When you, when you play with this valve and look inside, it's just a full port ball valve. So as you start getting, uh, you, if you look at the chart, you get a really fast reaction once you start getting to mostly closed. But when it's mostly open, or all the way closed, obviously there's not much change at all. So right where they start doing the balancing, it gets real critical. Now the difference with our valves compared to other people's valves, uh, again, I've sold others in the past, is ours will have different size orifices inside. So the difference is our valves were, were built for a specific flow rate or flow range. So you don't just use a half inch valve for all low flow applications or a three quarter for such a flow. We've got four different orifices for each size. So these orifices will give you more controlled pressure drop. So it's kind of like characterizing that ball valve so that it can be more fine-tuned. We can get real good balancing. In fact, these give you plus or minus, all the way down to plus or minus 1% accuracy, which is, is, is very good. Uh, most people are plus or minus 5%, plus or minus 10%. So this will give you very good accuracy because of these orifices. You can't take these orifices out and change them in these valves here. Okay, once they're pressed in, they're pressed in for good. So if you need to, if you need to operate with uh, uh, less of a pressure drop, then you need to re buy another valve with a bigger orifice inside. Okay, but all of these are built similar to this, uh, except they've got, I believe we did all female connections. Uh, they have a green cap and a red cap. This is where you test your flow differential. Okay, green is for the, the high flow or high pressure. Red is for the low pressure. And when I pass this around, You'll see on this uh, cap, you've got a couple of cutout grooves on the sides of this. Um, this valve would fit in like this. So just kind of play with it. So as the water flows through, the ball valve is after you to your testing. Um, so the water would flow through, it would enter the valve, and as it enters the valve, it would pass down this one side, getting the high pressure to this PMT orifice. And then it would come back to the top. And then it's got a little stop wall here, 
so that you're me measuring the pressure after the orifice. You're measuring the pressure drop across the orifice. And that will tell you what your differential pressure is. If you guys have a differential pressure gauge to do your own balancing, that's where you test it. So that's what these two ports are for. Okay? If you're not doing your own balancing, then you really don't have to worry about it. When you get into the bigger sizes, uh, anything two and, uh, two and a half inch or larger, you're going to have something like this. But without this groove coupling, you'll have all flange couplings on here. These things come with a gate valve. The gate valve uh, is what you're using to balance that. Again, they'll lock this down right here. So don't assume that this is your shutoff valve. Uh, you can use it as a shutoff valve, but you're going to screw up your balancing. So this thing will be locked down. Uh, very simple. The flow passes. Um, wait, if I can remember. The flow rate passes this direction. So the gate valve is the back end of it. As it passes through this, this direction, it's going to come across this little, what they call their twin tube or their pitot tube. This tube is actually patented with these guys. This will give you plus or minus 1% flow accuracy. Again, in order to measure flow, you have to measure differential pressure. Once we know the differential pressure, you can then measure your flow rate. So this pitot tube inserts into the cavity and drops down through the valve. On the green line, again, I'll pass this around to the back. I'll start right here. Take those around. Uh, this will be penetrated into the valve body. The water will flow into the green, uh, the holes on the green tube first. Again, high pressure. Red will be the low pressure. So the water will flow in this direction. It measures a pressure drop, a differential pressure on this side versus this side. That differential pressure can go back to a chart, and then you can determine what your flow rate is. So it's a real simple device with real tight flow accuracies. Okay. Um, the O&M manuals talk about how to, uh, uh, how to how to do this. Again, it's not real difficult stuff. Uh, it does talk about the flow accuracies, and it says here they do not require any annual or periodic maintenance. So your job's easy. Okay. However, if you do require some, if, if you're doing, I doubt you guys are ever going to use that though. You could connect some, if you're doing your own monitoring, you could connect some gauges or some feeds here that go back to a system that monitor your pressure controls. We do that. But as, if you're never going to use this, then I wouldn't even worry about this plugging up. But if you ever try to go back and balance, you may get these little holes. If your water chemistry is not very good, you may get these holes plugging up, which will then affect your pressure drop. Uh, these valves do have uh, five, one, two, three, four, five pre tapped connections in here. They'll all be capped except for one, which will have this in it. Um, well, unless the contractors use some of them. You can use these for anything you want. So if you need to put a thermometer in line, if you need to put a pressure gauge, if you need to put a drain valve, whatever you need in here, you can plug it in, take out the, the cap, uh, and then plug in whatever you want into that connection. However, where this is located, that cannot be changed. This has to be in the precise location where it already is, okay? so that we get good flow reading. A good accuracy flow to turn. Okay, but again, no maintenance on these things, so very simple components. Any questions on those? When you balance a system, do you balance it to a certain pressure? I'm not quite getting how you balance it when you got pumps on BFDs that are speeding up, slowing down, or pressures go up and down. But you're balancing, is it balanced to one pressure? How do you balance it to? Very it's a very good question. It's also a very loaded question. We could talk for all day on that topic. I can I can cover it pretty closely how BTC does does the balancing. Uh, their job is to figure out the point of control that they need to supply water to the hardened circuit to get water to, and that's where they try to determine where the differential pressure control should be at. And that's what will signal the VFDs to, to go up or down. And they do this through periodic testing. By the time they're done, they know this system really, really well. I have the heating water test and balance report in front of me right now. And I was just reviewing most of the balance valves into these reheat coils are going to be open or mostly open. There's very few throttle back, more than 50%. And that's just a credit to the engineer for figuring out how his pipe sizes and, and stuff really well. Um, but anyway, they, they, once they determined 
where that control point is, they will often do a lot of balancing in a dynamic state. At the end of the project, they will take pump information at that pressure, and this is minus any diversity, which is engineered in the building, which in this case is quite a bit. Uh, um, you know what diversity means. Uh, oh, diversity means uh, we've got maybe, uh, uh, we've got a four tons of chickens and we got a two ton truck and we just got to keep half the chickens flying, you know. Uh, uh, they don't ever, he doesn't ever anticipate this whole building on a full call for heat for any extended period of time. So the, the balancer has taken that into calculation during the balance, he's throttled back, he's eliminated the diversity during his balance, then he's you know, trying to play the show game that way. Does that make any sense? And it does. I'm, I'm just thinking of past problems we've had in other buildings where it doesn't seem like we're getting the flow. So our only idea is open up the balance valve yeah. to get more water. Every time you guys open a balance valve, you screw the rest of the system up. Yep. Every single one balance, just like a damper in a room. If you close that one damper, <clears throat> that air has to go somewhere else. Or it's taken away from somewhere else. Yeah, and we, we've been told we know we're not supposed to mess with them. So then what else can we do? Well, how about well, I'll, 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 I'll say this, though. Uh, we're still, it's still you know, the, basically the engineer's best guess on how the university is going to use the room. Now, we all know that that changes by the time the room gets to be used. You may have to adjust per temperature. I mean, that, that's, that's the reality. And, and, and there may be, not be much accurate way to do that unless you want to do a complete BTU study and but, whatever. But. but understand, as soon as you adjust one, you, affect. you, you say, okay, you know what, I, I'm just going to change it a little bit so I can get more heat to this coil. As soon as you do that, the entire, the entire system that's connected to that one valve has now been changed. Mm -hmm. So when, when a balancer ba a balances a system, what he has to do is, first, it's what we call proportional balance. Uh, he has to open up, turn the pump on if you've got VFDs, turn it up to 100%, and open up all the control valves, all of the balancing valves. Everything is wide open as it can be. And now he measures, okay, how much, I've got so much flow, how much pressure do I have? Hopefully he has more flow than he needs for the design that the engineer said, and it's creating a lot of pressure. If it's not the case, now we've got an undersized pump. So hopefully he's got a lot more than he needs. So now he's established, okay, I need so much uh, pressure drop. Again, it's pressure drop. I've got so much pressure drop that I need across these circuits, and I've got so many circuits, so he works at a proportional rate between all these different flows, and then he finds the circuit that has the worst case pressure drop. That might be the one at the very end of the circuit, or it might be some big air handling unit coil that's you know, in the middle of the system or right next to the mechanical. And then he's gonna start there and then proportionally set everything else up from that point. Now, I, the, the VFD comes into question all the time because what does the VFD do now? The VFD starts to modulate down. As the, as the pump starts to change speed, now what happens to your balance? Well, the reality is, is, is it's, it's totally off again. But uh, th this is the reason why we shouldn't have balancing valves. If you have a VFD, you don't want a balancing valve on the discharge side of the pump anymore because the VFD is, is trying to tune that in. And again, once that, that balancing valve has been set for that maximum flow rate, so we're going to Again, remember, a, a balancing valve doesn't give you flow. What does a balancing valve do? It restricts it. It creates a differential pressure. I'm going to create more pressure by closing this off so that I can now limit my flow rate. It has to eat up more pressure to get through that. So I set that when my pump's operating at 100% of its speed. And now the pump slows down. Who knows what it's at now? It's no longer balanced as to what you want it to be balanced to. So uh, the VFD really messes with things. So to answer your question, you know, how do I get more heat out here? If I were in your shoes, and this is what I try to teach, this is what I've actually been teaching the school districts, this is what we just taught up at the University of Utah, is if you guys really want to do, uh, do a service to your buildings, is I would buy a differential pressure gauge kit that will connect to anybody's balancing valve that you can plug up here and read a differential pressure. You go back to their charts and it'll tell you what kind of flow rate you want. And so if you're going to start making changes, it would be very, they're very easy to read if you understand what you're doing, and you can just get out there and, and mess with it and make sure the whole system's still somewhat in balance. Uh, that's gonna be your most cost-effective way. We've actually got the, the uh, um, I hate talking about this on a new job, but unfortunately, a lot of the engineers here in town use old technology. Uh, I, 
we've got a, a, student, a school district that's taking out all of these manual balancing valves and putting in the automatic flow limiting valves, or a valve that has a spring inside that will adjust as the pressures change in the system. So if you want 10 GPM, you know you've got 10 GPM. You don't have to sit there and play with any type of valve to do that. But um, yeah, you, what you guys need to understand with balancing valves is as soon as you touch it, you screw the whole system up. And are you guys hiring balancing guys to come in and retune your systems every year? Every five years, every 10 years? Have you ever done it with an existing building? We've done it in an existing building, but we're doing it by delta T. We're not doing it by pressure or water temperature. Your delta well, T is going to change off CFM. You're, we're not. You're exactly. Wherever you move, now your delta T screwed up. You're going to make that. See, I find myself point. disagreeing with that. Uh, if you adjust one, yeah, that will alter the whole thing. In the grand scheme, I related cutting a hair off your head. You're going to miss that hair for one space. I don't think so. So, but again, we're on the water side of temperature. We're not on the pressure side of distribution. And, and this is why it's not that big of a concern, why people don't make a big deal out of it, because hydronic systems are very forgiving. You know, you might not have a 20 degree delta T, you might have a 19 or 18. Nobody's really going to feel that. But where we start getting into energy conservation, and we want to start saving energy, that couple of degrees could equate into a whole lot of savings that go back into the pump that's operating 24-7, all heating season long, and that puts money back into the owner's pocket. Simple little tiny changes. You don't have to spend more money for all this technology, all these big expensive controls. So if you're worried about energy conservation, then, then I'm going to argue. But if, if all you're worried about is temperature control, you're not going to miss that hair on your head. You're right. Um, you know, they, they, the, the students might take, and I said this last time, it doesn't matter how efficient you are, if your occupants are uncomfortable, are you efficient? If your occupants miss that hair on that head, are you efficient? So that's what you've got to watch. If it takes 30 seconds longer to heat up that room, is anybody going to complain? Is anybody going to care? Hydronic systems are very forgiving. So, you know, chances are it's, it's not. Especially hydronic heating systems, chilled water systems where you have limited delta T's because of your air conditions outside. Then it's a little bit more temperamental. But on hot water systems, you know, open up a valve, somebody's going to be starved a little bit, but it's going to take a little longer. Nobody's going to care. But, can you get into energy conservation? I've got somebody right now who's going back and rebalancing their system, and just the cost of rebalancing it and replacing valves, they're going to pay that back in less than a year. So it's money going out the window, but people aren't uncomfortable. Really I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, again, what I would what I would recommend if you're if you're going to be energy minded, is you know, check that yourself. It's not that hard. In fact, I will gladly come down and teach you guys how to use it for free. We'll teach you how to use it. We'll go out and test a couple of your circuits for you, just to show you what to do. Okay? Any other questions or comments on balancing? Are the, uh, even though they do look different, are they all marked, physically marked in the building? Do they have anything other than that way you showed us? That we, yeah, now we know that as a balancing valve. I don't think so. No. I think they're all going to be insulated, and they're going to be tough to tell other than seeing this this handle sticking out of the insulation. Yeah. The reason I ask that is because, you know, everything we have in the other building, it totally looks totally different. They've got from, the big Yeah, most valves, of the circuits that are yeah. And so, you know, I mean, if you, we want to have this, but, oh, that's, that's just a shut-off valve. That's just a gate valve. Yeah. Yeah, that's just a ball valve. Yeah. Other than it has a butterfly valve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't, uh, don't wait. <laughs> Don't use these as shutoff valves. Um, it, you do have some of these, if I remember right, you've got some of them on the discharge of your pumps. Yes, you do. Where you've got two pumps, they come up uh, because they're pumping in parallel, they join into a common, and then they take off. In that common, uh, I think you've got these on every pump. Right? So they're there to balance, but again, you've got VFDs on these pumps, so they really don't need to be there. In fact, if I were the balancer on those VFD systems, in fact, on every one of them, you don't balance in the main circuit, you balance out at the individual circuits. And that in turn balances that whole system back to the pump. So if I were the balancer, at the discharge of every pump, I would just leave these wide open. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even balance this thing. And I'd do the balancing out of the circuits. 
I don't know what they'll do if they'll do that. But if this is pitched down to you know some level of mock, don't start messing with it because then you'll potentially unbalance the entire system. Some pumps are, are made to have so much foot ahead as well. And if you ha if you don't have enough head in the piping when you open this, you will pump less than you will when it's closed. So some pumps will actually move more. The pressure differential will grow as you close this pump, which means they're moving more volume. Yeah. So just things to watch. Um, uh, again, I I I've got a class that uh, we teach that's almost six eight hours in length just on balancing. So we can talk about balancing all day long. But uh, any questions on on your products that you've got or what what you need to do or not do? This is more for the. The building side here, at the end of the line, three-way valve, is there a balancing valve both on the, the last uh, coil and going back into um, the I, uh -huh. uh, I don't know. I don't think I'll have to check that detail. Um, <clears throat> it might not be as necessary as, as we make it sound. Uh, the one thing about balancing is in heating water, they did balance this building in a in the worst case scenario, which we may never see, we, we impose upon this building a full call for heating minus the diversity that was designed. And when the students are here and stuff, it, they rarely ever see that condition. And Joe, on Colvin's plans, do they usually show a balancing valve in the three-way bypass? I, I have the details here. I'll just have to find them. Um. Joe does a lot of our takeoffs, so he sees a lot okay. of Coleman's friends. Do you remember, John? Um, if they were showing the details, then we provided them. Uh, it looks like they got them on the bypass right here, Scott. Okay. And I'm sure they were provided, and I'm sure they were put in. So. And I would think on the bypass, that circuit center's most of the time wide open, or at least halfway, it wouldn't be closed down. Well, because well the bypass, would, it actually would be closed down more than the, uh, well, the other circuit would take up some, whatever, yeah. they balanced it, but you, then you have to simulate the, the pressure drop of the coil. Of the coil. Mm -hmm. So when we're piped directly to it, it's not going through the coil, so that, that's what the bypass circuit center would do. We'll see here. And as, you, as you're that molecule of water, and you enter this the circuit, you're going to go to the coil or you're going to go around the coil? And either way, it better cost you the same amount of energy to do that, because if it's bypassing the coil and now it's free, free for all, then a lot more people are going to be rushing down that highway and take that highway, and you're going to start starting other coils downstream, or upstream of that, or even downstream. So you want to make sure that whether you're going to the coil or whether you're going to the bypass, it's the same pressure drop. So as a balancer, he should be balancing that so that that balancing valve is set to simulate the pressure drop of what you're now bypassing, which is the coil itself. So that's typically what that would be set for. I mean, do we know how many of those we have in the line? Because this building, you know, different directions. And uh, I, I don't know exactly without looking at the mechanical okay. piping, but they're all marked on the mechanical okay. piping. Okay. Good questions. Anything else on this stuff? We all good? Last thing. Um, when you balance all the coils throughout the building, do you go to one certain number, uh, one certain setting of a balance, or do you like go from the end being the, the least amount to the, up to the pump being the most? Or Chances are, if the system's piped in a, in a direct return, so uh, yeah, this is this is uh, I just thought I'd check you on the three-way valves. This is a reverse return system, and I haven't yet to find anything that's going to be in a three-way valve. We might have one on the end of some of these longer little stub outs from the reverse return. Mm -hmm. But if you have a three-way valve, it's not going to be a, a huge one because the system itself is reverse yeah. return or self-circulating. So so because it's a reverse return. You're going to enter this coil first, but it's going to be the last one out. So it, the, the, it's, it's kind of what I call a self-balance system. Mm -hmm. uh, where a direct return, you're going to hit this first coil, and it's going to be the first one back. So it's going to take a little pressure to get there. It's going to take a lot of pressure to get all the way out to the end of the building, to that coil, and all the way back. So in that case, in that scenario, chances are this one closest to the pump is going to be really throttled down, and the ones way out of the back of the loop are going to be 
almost wide open. Um, and it's going to be kind of staged. Now you might have one coil, uh, or again what I call an index circuit, that, that circuit has really high pressure drop. You got a big coil, you got uh, big valves, and it's, it's got a lot of pressure drop to get through that. So that might be different. But when they balance the system, they have to identify that index circuit. That's going to be the worst case, and then they proportionally balance everything else from there, you know, whichever direction they have to go. So, yeah, uh, in a reverse return, all you're doing now, because the piping losses to get to that and then away from it are the same to get to that far one and then back from that. They're the same. So now all that balancing valve is being set for is not to help push the water out to the end of the circuit, but just to help so that each circuit has the same drop. Because one coil might have a 10 foot loss. This coil has an 8 foot loss. So I need to set this one to 2 feet so that they're not equal. So if I'm that molecule of water and I want to get from point A back to point B to the section of the pump, it's going to cost me the same amount of energy to take either direction. I compare it to uh, I-215 and I-15. Why would I ever take, if I'm going from Provo to Salt Lake, why would I get up in Salt Lake Valley and take 215 around to get to Salt Lake and take the straight shot through I-15? Unless what? Traffic. Unless you've got a, a traffic accident or really bad traffic. So it's now starting to back up. So because it's backing up, now we'll take the other routes. We have to create that accident so that we force the water, so, you know, some water will still go through there, but the rest of the water will take the other routes we want to do that so that it now balances so we get the right flow in all the surface that we want. So we're creating pressure to try to get flow, the right flow that the engineer wants through that coil. He sized the coil for 10 GPM, so we got to get 10 GPM there by creating accidents and all these different bike, you know, off-roads or whatever. Okay. All right. Um, last but not least is the plate and frame heat exchanger. I guess we do. The expansion tanks, well, the plate frame heat exchangers, um, I don't believe the engineer gave you an ability to backflow these things. He didn't give you a crossover. Do you guys have any have crossover piping on any of your heat exchangers? So when you have to clean your existing heat exchangers, are you taking them apart, taking the plates out, and washing them down? Chemically. So you're doing the, the closed way of doing it instead of taking everything apart. Okay. Um, it works best if you can back flush it. Would you do a back flush? I guess you really don't have a way to do that because they didn't give you that bypass. Um, I don't think these have a bypass either because I don't remember seeing that on the plan. So you'll have it's the same thing. You'll just have to do the forward flush. Um, and if you're going to do a chemical, then you really don't have to take them apart. But there's, I mean, there's nothing magical to it if you do need to take them apart. Uh, it's just a plank from the exchange. Uh, they've given you a pretty big manual here for it. Um, so if you would like to have some reading material, you've got it. But uh, it's what they call the cleaning in place, or the CIP, is what uh, uh, the manual cleaning, you can take them out and, like they show here, put it on the ground and wash them or scrub them or do whatever. Do you guys ever take these apart, your existing ones? I have. That's not, not for cleaning, but maybe to replace a gasket or replace a plate. For cleaning, you have to get them apart. They're in a condenser one, but the chemical gets out of whack. They'll be plugged solid. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thing to them. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's not nice. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. And you've got a pretty big one upstairs that uh, is not too small. So, uh, the reason the engineer used the plate and frame heat exchangers was to, I believe, on this job, was to isolate the glycol, higher percentage of glycols from the rest of the system. Um, so, that's why they're there. Which gives you new pumps, a lot more pumps, and a lot more expansion tanks, a lot more air separators, and you got a lot more different closed systems. So a lot more stuff to maintain. Um, anything you want to talk about specifically on the, the plate and frame heat exchangers? Again, no moving parts. There's not a lot of maintenance other than just making sure. You've got pressure gauges. I'd watch the pressure gauges. I think you've got pressure gauges. So just watch the pressure gauges. I'd document that. And as your pressure differential continues to increase, that's a good sign that it's starting to get plugged. So start doing some cleaning. Um, if you want to watch temperatures, you can watch temperatures. But again, temperatures can change based on the loads outside. So uh, that's the plane frame heat exchangers. The uh, expansion tanks, uh, the expansion tanks you have here are all diaphragm type. They are not replaceable bladders. So if you rupture a diaphragm, you got to replace the tank. Um, the uh, uh, what else do we have? 
there are some fairly big ones. Um, do not check. Uh, I see this happen a lot with expansion tanks. Is just. Do you guys have any old school tanks? Uh, what we would call just an old compression tank that sits up on the ceiling, and that doesn't have it. It's not pressurized. It doesn't have a diaphragm or a bladder. None of those. Okay. They always have a sight glass. They, they have a sight glass on them, so you can see the water. Make sure that there's an air pocket up there. Uh, okay, that's good. So what, what we see, people who have those systems, that they, they like to be able to see if that tank is flooded or not. So because you can't see that on this tank, they'll walk over, and all of these tanks have a little Schrader valve on them. Let's go make sure there's air pressure. Every time you do that, you're letting the air out, and you're going to have more pressure on the water side than you will on the air side, and eventually you're going to lose your expansion. And you're going to, well, what are you going to see if you lose your expansion? What's the first sign? Fluctuating pressure. Increased pressure. Increase pressure. Okay, increased pressure, but you usually Light don't side. see that. You'll see a pop relief valve. If you start popping a relief valve, the very first thing you should check is your expansion tank. See if your expansion tank is ruptured. Uh, because if you're popping relief valves, you're expanding too much, and you might not have an expansion tank. Water is non-compressible for the most part. So if there's no air cushion in there to compress, then this water as it heats up uh, will just, yeah, its pressure will skyrocket very quickly just from a degree or two. So if you start popping relief valves, the very first thing you should check is that expansion tank. Make sure that it's got the right air charge in it. Okay? If you have to replace an expansion tank, you, uh, it, it's, this is one thing that a lot of people fail to do, is you have to isolate the expansion tank, you have to try to get all of the water out of it, and then set your air charge. The air charge has to be done before there's water in the tank. You can't let water in the tank and then set your air charge because now it's too late. You have to set the air charge. So if the building, if the, if the system is set to 60 PSI and your, your expansion tank's down here in the bottom, then you're going to want to have that isolated, no water in it, set the air charge to 60 to 65 PSI, and then let the water into it. The water shouldn't go into it, right? Because it's 60 PSI, 60 PSI, no water should move. When does it go into the tank? As the water starts to expand, as it starts to heat up, as we start to build pressure. So now your pressure gauges will start to go up because you're pushing water, you're forcing water in the tank, so your pressures will go up slightly. So, again, that's, that's what you want to watch. How, what do you recommend when you go and ch check your air bladder? You know, you say every time you let a little out, you lose your air. So, can you back off your pressure, isolate again, and then put it back to system pressure? If you've lost your air charge? Well, no. I'm saying if, how do you... Just you know, check. we've gone around and checked with the straight route, you know, when you, when you get water Just straight route, it's bladder back. Yeah. And so, what do you recommend and how you check them if you don't recommend doing that? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I, I certainly don't recommend pushing the Schrader valve. Uh, Putting air back into it after we do it. Do what? They should be valved off every year and should be checked. Yeah. If you need to add air, that's yeah. the time to add it. So on every one, you should have a drain coming off of it. So you can hook a hose to it, especially if it's on your glycol system, so you can catch on and return all your glycol. So you can, you can check it. It's, it's you're going to find, this is no different than a car tire. What happens to a car tire if you put it in your garage and let it sit for two years? It goes flat. Bladder is the exact same thing. It will lose the air, period. It, it seeps through that, uh, <clears throat> the water will seep through the diaphragm or the bladder slowly over time, just like the rubber in your tires. It will slowly seep through and it will uh, be absolved into your water system. So you'll slowly but surely lose that charge. Uh, it's very difficult to get all the water out of an expansion tank. So. You know, because you, you've got this tank, and just because you let the water out, and it's not this bladder that you can just squeeze, especially these diaphragm types. You just can't squeeze it all out. You can't physically get in there and do that. So it's, it's kind of a tough thing to, to do. Uh, what I would do is I'd, I'd watch your pressures. Um, you know, your pressures on your system, and if you start popping relief valves, then go back and check the tank. If you can isolate it, you can get the water out. It is something that you probably should check. Manufacturers don't, don't really even state that here. They just talk about pre-charging and trying to purge the air before the tank is in, in operation. But uh, you know, that's why we do give you, or they should have given you isolation valves and a drain line so that you can try to drain that tank and check it. Okay. I think that's it. I had to cut a lot out, but uh, yeah. Any questions on, on anything?
I say, if you guys have any problems with the boilers, I said this last time, but on any of these valves on the pumps, uh, let us know. We might have to run down here and, uh, and do what we can. And I assume I didn't bring copies of O&Ms this time, so I, I assume that's all getting in the, the O&M manuals. And it's all been in the O&M manuals. Okay, so you, you should have all of this information that we went over.